Did you ever want to be a time traveler? To go back in time to see the dinosaurs? Or to visit the future to see how something turned out? Well, I am a time traveler, and in the next few minutes, I want to show you how time travel is useful in innovation. Now, when I say I'm a time traveler, I don't mean I'm from the past or from the future, future, future. <laughs> no, I'm from right now. But I've traveled thousands of years into the past by studying Latin and ancient Greek. And in my work as a geologist and geophysicist, I went even farther back, millions and billions of years. Today, I work into the future as a space technologist, applying the lessons of yesterday and today to the problems of tomorrow. Many of the things we can't do in space yet are things we've been doing on Earth for a very long time. And sometimes to move forward, you have to look back. We don't currently refuel satellites. What would it be like if every time you ran out of gas, you left your empty car piled up with the other ones by the side of the road and went out and bought a new car? Well, that's kind of how it is in space right now. But on Earth, we have a long history of refueling our vehicles, everything from grazing our horses to refueling aircraft in mid-flight. I had the opportunity to work on a satellite refueling project, and one of the many challenges in that field is deciding who will do which part of the distribution. When we fill up our cars, we take them to the gas station. But when we fill up a plane in the air, the gas station comes to the plane. Looking at these and other analogies helped me to consider different fuel distribution models for space. I looked back again on a recent family trip. I told myself as we were leaving that I would turn off work and focus on our vacation. We went to this beautiful town in southern France that's built up on ancient Roman ruins, and there's a museum there with an exhibit on metal recycling in the ancient world. When I saw that, I was jolted right out of vacation and right back to work because another aspect of what I do is metal recycling for space. Humans have launched thousands of tons of metal into space over the years, and a lot of it's not being used anymore, like those old empty satellites. Metal recycling could find itself at the fulcrum of industrial activity in space because it has literally been a linchpin of civilization for thousands of years. When we first started our work on metal recycling, we looked back at what our colleagues at NASA had learned from melting metals on the International Space Station over the past 20 years. We have other colleagues who plan to drill holes in asteroids, and they should learn what they can from experienced drillers. Now, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> it's not quite like the movie Armageddon, but you get the general idea. In real life, though, even oil drillers got good at it by looking back. When they wanted to figure out how to drill horizontal wells in the ground, they looked at old patents for dental drilling and used those as a jumping-off point. By educating yourself on the state of the art you're trying to advance, you're turning the wheel toward the future instead of reinventing the wheel. But what happens when you can't use the latest technology as a jumping-off point for your innovation? We study the possibilities for making metals out of moon rocks, and we've looked at the state of the art on Earth in metal making from different angles, but we just can't use it. We have to look farther back in time to find a jumping-off point. When that happens, I like to think of innovation as a pendulum. In one swing, a disruptive innovation sets off an accelerating flurry of follow-on and copycat innovations, and then decelerates into spin-offs and standardizations until momentum on that path runs out, and a new disruptive innovation takes hold. Often, that new disruptive innovation leverages an old idea that finds new life. We've all seen that pendulum across industries, and the simplest example I can think of is in fashion. Skinny jeans. 
they go through various iterations before baggy jeans take over, and then it's skinny jeans once again. <laughs> These patterns are so reliable in their pendulum action that they help to define our generations. But innovation isn't quite as simple as just going back and forth. That wouldn't be innovation. Something new is always part of the new solution from an old idea. The genes are high-waisted this time, or acid wash, or spandex. So the pendulum I'm thinking of is a very special kind. It's a Foucault pendulum. There's a really good one right here in Boulder, Colorado, in the Duane Physics Laboratory on CU's campus. You should go see it if you get a chance. But the first one I saw was in the lobby of the Hunt Oil Building in Dallas, Texas. I went there for a meeting several years ago, and when we were finished with the meeting, we decided to stay and watch the pendulum for a few minutes. It is spectacular. I was completely engrossed, and by the time I looked up, everybody else was gone. <laughs> it was getting dark out, and the security guard and I were making awkward eye contact. You see, a Foucault pendulum is a time machine. The pendulum swings back and forth, but then it seems to turn so that it can be used as a clock. Why is that? It's because the earth is turning underneath it, and the building it's housed in is turning around it with the earth. So even though the pendulum swings in a constant plane, we perceive that plane as rotating because we are standing in the building on the earth. And that's how innovation works. We have these solutions, these ways of doing things, and when we have a solution that's been working, we expect it to work forever. But the earth keeps turning underneath us, changing the circumstances, and no matter how good that solution was, if it were the best, best practice anybody ever did, new circumstances would still drive the need for a different solution over time. Anybody who's run a business in the past five years saw these patterns in supply chain management. <laughs> we spent decades perfecting just-in-time inventory. But then the pandemic came along, shifting the earth beneath our feet, and just-in-case inventory found a new life and path for innovation. We see it in other industries as well where we spent a century or two building larger and larger centralized infrastructure like steel mills, power plants, and refineries. But the way we measure risks and costs is changing, and that puts economies of scale on different footing. We're seeing movement back towards smaller local operations that distribute risk, cost, and control. And now, with the pendulum and the turning earth in mind, let's get back to making metals out of moon rocks. On Earth, we are really, really good at making steel. It goes kind of something like this. We mine some banded iron rock formation, and we blast it to smithereens. We mine some bituminous coal, and we bake it down to coke. We put those two things together with a dash of limestone, a jet of superheated air, a supersonic flow of pure oxygen, and we are good. <laughs> but we've reached a point in the Foucault pendulum where the circumstances are just too different for that. On the moon, the iron is in different forms. We don't have coal. We don't have limestone. We don't have air and the oxygen is trapped in the moon dust. So we're not good to go for steel on the moon. At the same time, we don't need steel on the moon. At one-sixth of Earth's gravity, the moon won't pull down on our structures the way the Earth does, and we won't need the strength of steel. The moon will make other demands, though. Whatever we use will have to endure high radiation, frequent bombardment by micrometeorites and extreme temperature changes between night and day. We have to look farther back 
in time instead of using today's state of the art as a jumping off point. Perhaps a hundred years, maybe millennia to the dawn of metallurgy or the turn of the Iron Age. We need to ask how steel came to be in the first place. How did people design the recipes for what they had and what they needed? And how should we start that process over again for the moon's particular resources and environment? To move forward, we look back. As you navigate your way into the future, take the time to look back. And the next time the earth shifts under your feet, imagine yourself swinging on that great pendulum, where across time will you find the inspiration for your next move? Join me as a time traveler, and I'll see you in the future. <laughs>